I always tell myself in races, like, no matter how it's going, always believe something wonderful is going to happen. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes because even when, you know, you think, oh, this is the worst thing ever. I wish I had just stayed home or something like that. Like you'll be gifted something from that race. Like whether it's an experience or somebody that you meet along the way or something that you've never seen before, a memory that you'll have with you for life. And so I just try to keep telling myself that like, this is just such a unique experience um, that I'm really lucky to be able to have, even though my race is going sideways. Women's running, running, running. running. Running running stories. Stories. Hi, I am Sika Henry. I am a professional triathlete, marathoner, and I'm new to ultra running. I work a full-time job as a corporate analyst for Ferguson Enterprises. I have actually been working in this industry for 14 years now, and so I consider myself a, yeah, a, a regular full-time a uh, corporate person and also an athlete. Yes, in this episode, we are featuring the story of Sika Henry. And in particular, we will be focused on her experiences at the recent 2023 Comrades Marathon, which took place on June 11th. But before we get to Sika's story, welcome to Women's Running Stories. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am your host and producer. And we are a proud member of the Evergreen Network of Podcasts. I also want to welcome you to listen to a couple of other shows in the network that I know you will like. They're Here Her Sports, hosted by Elizabeth Emery, and Keeping Track, hosted by Molly Huddle, Roisin McGettigan, and Alicia Montano. We are all women-hosted podcasts featuring women athletes and other women in the sports space. So if you've been a follower of Women's Running Stories, you will know that we have a very strong fondness for the Comrades Marathon. It is the 90-kilometer or roughly 56-mile road race that happens each year in South Africa. It is the oldest and largest ultra-distance foot race in the world. It is a point-to-point event running between Peter Maritzburg up in the hills and Durban down on the coast. Each year, the race switches direction. When it runs from Peter Maritzburg to Durban, it is a net downhill. When it switches directions, it is a net uphill. So there are up years and there are down years. But whatever direction you go, there is plenty of climbing and descending. Very little on the Comrades course is flat. We have many episodes focused on women's experiences at the Comrades Marathon, and I welcome you to listen to them all. In there, you will also find an episode about my experiences at Comrades last year. I ran Comrades again this year, and there will be an upcoming episode about that soon. Please stay tuned. Now on to Sika's story. Like she mentioned, Sika is a professional triathlete, and in fact, she is the first African-American woman to earn her pro card in that sport, which she did in 2021. Sika has also entered into the worlds of marathoning and ultramarathoning, and in 2020, Sika ran a sub-three-hour marathon, adding her name to The List, which accounts for all of the American-born Black women who have broken three hours in the marathon. There are currently exactly 30 women on the list. Now, a couple of things to know for this episode— You will hear Sika mention Mike Wardian, Devin Yanko, Camille Heron, and Herda Stain. They are all professional distance runners who have run comrades. Of particular note here, Herda Stain holds the course record for the uprun, which she set in 2019 with her first victory at comrades. This year, she was the favorite, and she did win again, setting the course record for the down run. You will also hear Sika mention the A Corral. There are so many runners at Comrades that we are all put into separate corrals based on our marathon qualifying time. You do have to qualify to get into Comrades with a sub 450 marathon, and you are lined up accordingly, starting with the A Corral at the front, featuring the fastest runners, 
and going from there. It's also worth noting that Comrades is a gun-to-gun race, which means we all start at the same exact time. And your time is recorded starting when the gun goes off to when you cross the finish line. So there is no chip time in this race. All right, now let's get to it. Let's get on to Sika's story, which she tells completely in her own voice. Here is Sika Henry. I had always wanted to do a big ultra, and I ex- I'll call it experimentation. I did the JFK 50 in uh, November 2021. That was my first ultra. And um, I wouldn't wouldn't say that I had like really trained for it. It was literally off the back of just triathlon racing pro half Ironman training. And yeah, after that experience of going in underprepared, I wanted to actually like get some decent mileage in and get my marathon time down and see how I would do in a uh, more competitive ultra. So I signed up for a hundred K last year in December and I surprisingly ran it pretty quick, faster than probably me or anybody else was expecting. And I broke the um, Virginia 100K record, the state record, and I ran actually the fast, the 10th fastest time by an American woman last year. But anyway, I say all that to say that I started getting my toes wet in ultras. And I told my mentor, Dan Emfield, he actually, he invented the first triathlon bike and the triathlon specific wetsuit. And he's been mentoring me for the past few years. But when I told him that I was getting into into ultras, he was like, well, if you do an ultra, you got to do comrades. And I'm like, well, what is this? <laughs> what is comrades? Um, he said it was, he just told me it was in South Africa. He said it's the largest one. He's like, I'm not talking about a thousand, two thousand people. He's like, I'm talking 20,000 people running through South Africa. I'm like, wait, what? And he knows that I'm really driven when I choose races by, I guess there has to be some kind of like historical context or of importance about it to me, um, especially as an African American woman in who usually does gravitates towards sports where there is such a lack of diversity. So I can't exactly put my finger on what drives me to certain races, but he knew it would be up my alley for whatever reason. And of course I go online, I start Googling. And then he also sent me, um, I think it was in the New York times, um, the story about a South African guy. Um, he was one of the first to excel there and he was one of the first black South Africans to do the race. Um, I don't think blacks were allowed in the race until like 1975 or something like that, which is wild because it's in South Africa, right? So yeah, I just started doing my homework on it and, and researching and, you know, learning where was it located. I thought it was unique in terms of the switching of direction. You know, some years are up and some are down. So just the more I read about it, the more fascinated I became. You know, as you Google and you're looking at pictures and I'm like, oh my gosh, literally a sea, like thousands of people running from one city to the next um, over the course of 55 miles. It just looked incredible. And I looked at some of like, who were the past winners? I saw that Camille Heron had won before um, and she was previously a Hoka athlete. So I had actually reached out to her and I know a few other ultra runners um, that have done it before, like Devin Yanko. So I reached out to them to get a feel of like, well, what's it like? What's it like on the competitive end? And it's interesting because I actually had to pay out of pocket for that race and cover my own expenses and everything. That's how much I wanted to do it. And I had literally just planned to go as a regular runner. My time was good enough to get me in the A corral. But um, when I went to Kona last year as part of the Ironman Foundation um, ambassador team, I did a lot of spectating and volunteering. And I met Gary Babich who is um, on Team Fantani um, Athletic Club in South Africa. And I met one of his athletes, um, Sinelli, who is a Black South African uh, elite Ironman triathlete, actually. And when they found out that I was doing Comrades, they reached out and they're like, oh, you know, let us know if you want us to pick you up from the airport and show you around and yada yada. And I was like, well, one of the things that I'm most curious about is like, nutrition and bottle support. I mean, this isn't 
just a marathon where you can rely on just water stations, especially when you're racing internationally, you know, where we are, we're used to Gatorade and stuff, but there it's a different type of setup. So wasn't even sure how I was going to be able to handle getting in like all the nutrients that I'm used to training with and electrolytes and stuff. And he was like, well, our club does have some elite women and we're going to be able to give bottle support out there. They had um, like kind of VIP stations along the course. And he said, if you want to run as part of the team, um, like in our kit and everything, we can help support you. And he's like, um, you know, I'll pitch it to the founder president of the club and do. And if you want to like submit your times and everything else, so, you know, I'll see what he says. And it kind of just went from there. And yeah, I think just having previously ran a sub three hour marathon and running that hundred K time that helped open the door for me to be able to run as an elite and part of their team. So Mdu, he's the president and founder. His background's a bit interesting. He came from very poor family. Um, he had dropped out of school and everything, gained a ton of weight, um, but eventually he found his way back into running and went to school and graduated and everything. But he just saw, like for him personally, how much positive running brought to his life, especially when he started winning races and stuff. Like it was um, enough money to help take care of him and his family. And in South Africa, you know, the unemployment rate's 40%. And a lot of kids out there, they think that you know, soccer is like the only pro sport if they make it that they can make money. Um, They don't realize, you know, like the money that can be made in distance running and marathoning and stuff like that. So he formed this team and it's pretty much to seek out talent, um, underprivileged kids who show some promise, not necessarily like winning a a cross country race, but like the person, the kid who comes in fourth or fifth that shows a lot of promise. And um, he supports them, puts them on the team and provides them with uh, some kind of sponsorship. So like with them, they're supported by Total Sport to provide shoes and athletic apparel and stuff like that. And Um, Yeah, so it's still kind of a new team and it's developing and they train right there at Durban and um, there's a track out there and and stuff like that. So, yeah, when they said that I could represent the team, I was like, oh, that's awesome. You know, I can at least bring some attention to the team and what he's doing. Uh, It's funny, I talked to Mike Wardian uh, this was after Boston, right after the race. We were talking about comrades, and I'm like, yeah, I think this will be good prep work for comrades. He's like, no, this is absolutely nothing like comrades. Like, you thought Heartbreak Hill was hard? Like, no, there is nothing like comrades, which kind of frightened me a little bit. So I don't think I realized the difficulty of the course. And I think when you hear, like, this year the direction was down, from, so it went from Peter Martzburg to Durban, so there was a net loss. So you think, oh, I'm running downhill a lot. That's going to be great. Like it's going to propel me to a fast time or, you know, something like that. Or towards the end when it goes really down, you're like, okay, I can bank time or something like that. But you don't realize the how hard it is on the body and like how much it just stretch your quads or what your body is going to feel like, you know, 40 miles into the race and you're still having to run downhill for a mile straight. Um, and where I live, I live in Newport News, Virginia, like near the beach, and it's pancake flat out here. So it was really hard to mimic anything similar to what I experienced out there. And I think our like trying to imagine what 4,000 feet of you know elevation gain is and 6,000 feet of elevation loss, it, it's just numbers on a paper or when you're looking at a map, you're like, okay, that looks really hilly, but there's nothing like seeing it in person. And I drove the course the day before the race and it scared me. It opened my eyes to how difficult the course is. I, I knew right away that I hadn't prepared for something like that. Yeah, I would say I knew I was in over my head when I got a preview of, of what the course was like the day before. I was just sitting there shaking like this was not a good idea and I might end up walking a lot of this. And it's funny because that's what ended up happening. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. 
I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman. It was such a unique race day experience because I had to get up at 1 a.m. We had to get picked up. I was lucky Gary with the Fontaine Athletic Club. They picked me up, me and my partner, Ben. He was there supporting me. So they picked us up at 2 a.m. So I got up at 1. I made my typical breakfast, pre-race breakfast, like oatmeal and bananas and and, um, electrolytes and stuff like that. But I packed it in the car to go to wait till I kind of fully woke up. So, and I guess the ride was about an hour um, to get there to the start. And yeah, it's funny because Gary was just in the front with his wife, just chit-chatting away. (laughs) I was just sitting there like waiting for my impending doom, um, eating my oatmeal. And so I just felt kind of half awake. I was surprised by how cold it was, but I wore layers And then when we got there, we parked. And because I had an elite status or elite bib, I was allowed to go in the church that where the elites were. And and then I walked in there and then I felt like I was going to faint because I saw all these like really, really super fast people like her. And yeah, I just went over there and I sat with them. And and then I just started like kind of going over how I wanted the data unfold in my head, like take it easy and hold back and try not to, you know, go to go out too fast with everybody in my head. I thought that I was capable of a sub seven and a half hour race. And, and then before you knew it, you know, they told all the elites to line up and they had the front part of the race sectioned off with, which was absolutely incredible. I mean, to stand in the front of, you know, 15,000 people with all these incredible women, they put the women on one side and, you know, here I am in the presence of like just amazing talent. And yeah, that was just a once in a lifetime experience that I felt that I was gifted (laughs) that I did not deserve, but it was pretty cool. You know, if I could go back, I think I might've started just with everybody in Corral A. I was kind of thrust to the front and there were, you know, cameras and news people and photographers and, you know, Herdo's right there and they were doing interviews. So it was a bit chaotic and distracting. I mean, incredible, but also, yeah, I would say just a little bit distracting versus had I been like in the back in the mix with, you know, like the, just all the people and everything waiting. Um, and then also I was worried about getting trampled. Honestly, everybody goes out really hard. And I knew my goal was just like, honestly, I just wanted to go through the first mile in like eight minutes, which I ended up going through in like seven minutes. Cause it just went out so hard. So I would say being at the front of the race was quite different than being like, for me, I just done Boston, the Boston Marathon, like the month before. And I was, um, you know, like a few corrals back. So yeah, it was like night and day experience. Other than it going out pretty fast through the first mile, I mean, looking at my watch and being a bit surprised by how fast I went out. um, I've kind of just settled into a groove still a little faster than I had wanted. I looked down and I was like, oh, I'm still averaging under 730s. And it just felt way too early in the race to be going that fast. Um, You know, my coach said, like, no matter what, just try to hold back until literally mile 40 is like, you know, there's always time to pick up the pace later on, but hold back. And I, yeah, I kind of felt like went into a rhythm pretty early. I still had layers on to stay warm because it was chilly. It was, I don't know, 40 something degrees Fahrenheit. And because I had been up for so long and waiting, I immediately started kind of taking in the the goo gels that I had and, and just looking around to see if there was anybody that I could run with. I mean, I think that's the best with races when you find somebody who's running like the same rhythm as you are, or, like gunning for the same time or something like that to be able to share miles. It just makes it easier. But unfortunately, I couldn't find anyone and people were passing by really, really quickly. So yeah, the first 10 miles or so went by really fast. And then I would say 
around like the 20K mark, I started feeling it in my legs. I was surprised that I was feeling it so early on. It wasn't like a, oh, I'm out of breath or I went too fast or something. It was just, oh, my quads are starting to ache a little. Um, and then that was the beginning to, of the end of my my race day. <laughs> and then it was a death march the rest of the way. I think I just kept thinking in my head, I can't believe this is happening. Like I did everything that I my coach and I had talked about. I think I went through the marathon in 3.30. When I did my 100K, so 62 miles, that last ultra I did, I went through the marathon in 3.20. And, you know, I blew up a little, but I still held it together. So I figured like we thought, you know, 3.30, you'll be fine. And But the fact that I think I hadn't gotten in enough hill training, um, especially on my long runs, my body – just couldn't recover from going, you know, even though it's considered a down year, the first, like, I don't know, 25 to 30 miles is mostly up. And then when I started to go down, my quads just started to ache. And I physically got to a point where I couldn't really run without it hurting. Like my legs would start to get wobbly and kind of buckle. Yeah, it's like, okay, I think I feel okay. Let me try to run again. And then you almost go down and you're like, oh, okay. Well, now it's all about preservation to make sure that I do get to the finish line. I didn't necessarily think I'm going to quit or I'm going to pull off. I just started getting nervous that I wasn't even going to be able to have control and I wasn't going to be able to finish the race because my legs wouldn't let me go. So I just started really trying to do anything to get through each like 5k. So I started like thinking, okay, maybe nutrition will help. I started taking in more gels than I normally would. I started drinking Coke really early on. I saw that, you know, there were people passing by that had the green bibs on, which meant that they had done comrades 10 or more times. So I would make conversation with them. Like, I'm having a really hard time. My quads hurt. Is there anything that, have you been through this before? Is there anything that you could suggest to help me? And some of them would say, just take walk breaks frequently and, or, you know, try to run the uphills or and then walk some of the downs. And I was literally just desperate in trying anything, but I was also going through just a feeling of embarrassment. Um, You know, I had this elite bib on and you can tell somebody is elite because their first name is on their bib. And my name is African. It's from Ghana. And so everybody out there could pronounce my name. So I just heard go Sika or Sika. Yes. Sika the entire way. And I just kind of wanted to hide my bib. I'm like, I don't want people to look at me. I don't want anyone to say anything to me. But being a black woman, uh, I think that they also went particularly wild when I went by, which was pretty cool. Um, I guess you don't see as many black women. I think the race is like, what, 70? No, actually, I think it's 80% men, 20% women. So there's a pretty big gender gap there. And so, yeah, I felt um, a lot of support as a black woman out there. And I knew that they recognized that because they would say things like go sis or, you know, yeah, there's a sister out there and and stuff like that. So they were acknowledging that I was a black woman out there doing this race. Yeah, it was just an emotional roller coaster because I was out there for so many hours. Comrades is an experience. To me, it's not just a race. It literally is an experience. It's just such a big deal out there. I mean, you know, you think, Boston is huge and, you know, people are aligned for 26 miles, but imagine that for 55 miles and different sections that I went through was a unique experience. Um, Even early on when it did start to get warm, I remember everybody telling me when you take your clothes off and you toss them to the side, guaranteed like people in the village will come and pick them up and bring them home. And so I remember waiting until I got to an area where I saw kids waiting for clothes and to take my Hoka gear off and, um, and toss it to the side. And, you know, you saw the the people there like collecting clothes to use. And sometimes groups would pass me and they would be running together and I could tell they were international or foreign and they were speaking a different language and there'd be, you know, three or four of them talking in whatever language, you know, French or Italian or whatever else. So yeah, it was total like experience every few miles through something new at me. 
you know, like we're out here in the U.S., there's pace groups. There they're called buses. And I didn't understand that until the first bus passed me. <laughs> and it was, you know, a guy leading it. There were, were about 50 runners with him. They were on pace for a seven and a half hour comrades finish. So I decided to like hop on this bus and stay with them. And I was in the middle of it. People are singing and chanting. Um, everybody kind of shares the work Um, at the front. And it was interesting how uh, because these buses were so big and you were kind of surrounded by people, it was very hard to get to nutrition on the right or the left side. So like water stations and stuff, but because they had water sachets, um, they are like in a small little plastic bag that you have to bite into in order to get the water um, instead of them handing us cups. So people who were on the outside could grab a bunch of them. And if you just yelled out like water, somebody would pass you fluids. So it was like everybody was working together in unison to get to the finish line. It sounded like people were really racing each other. It's like, okay, what can we do to help everybody stay on this bus to get this time? Um, And there were a few times I thought, wow, I'm running with so many people black people, honestly. Um, I've been doing endurance. I've been racing in endurance sports for about a decade now. And, you know, in triathlon, it's not diverse, especially at the elite level. And, uh, you know, you do a full Ironman or something like that, and it's really not diverse. So that was unique to me, looking around and, and seeing, you know, people that I was just running with, people of color and The other thing that stood out to me was when you went through different towns, like some towns were wealthy and some weren't. And I did notice that the the towns that weren't, um, you know, where there was more poverty, that's where you saw more black people, the wealthier towns where people were out, you know, grilling and barbecuing, there were nice houses. And, you know, they sat out there in their chairs with their dogs and those were white towns. And and so there was almost like a bit of a history lesson uh, unfolding as I was running through the towns and noticing th- things. Um, had I been racing, I think, like had I been in peak form and like racing through, I wouldn't have noticed so many things like languages spoken and, and different neighborhoods and, and stuff like that. But because I was just kind of suffering and waddling along, I was able to like take in absolutely everything. I felt like the last three miles just felt like they took forever. Well, first somebody comes flying by me and, you know, your name, my first name's on the back of my bib. And they're like, Sika, the triathlete. And he's like, I'm such a huge fan. Like, you're amazing. As he's like sprinting by me and I'm just dying. I'm like, oh, gosh, go figure. So that's a little bit distracting. But then you know, you're kind of on this highway running there and you're like just wanting it to get closer, but it's just taking so long. And then all of a sudden there's just like a sea of people absolutely everywhere. I wasn't expecting that. Um, It was, it was weird. It was like, that was the most quiet part of the course, I would say about 2k out from the finish line. And then all of a sudden you're like right in the city and there's just so many people and I wish I had taken in the crowds more, honestly, when I entered the stadium. But instead, I was just like looking for the finish line. Like, please just get me through the finish line. Yeah, I wish I had some something exciting or some spectacular moment that I could share about me finishing. But it was really just, honestly, I've crossed the finish line. I was like, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe my body failed me. It's really what I was thinking. But then it had me think about... Um, how just how hard you can train for something and it not go like the way you want it to but like getting to the finish line at the end of the day is still just an incredible feat like not everybody can just go out and do 55 miles or have the finances to be able to travel to South Africa to experience that so I just thought to myself well how blessed am I that you know I'm financially in a position that I can, you know, be able to do this because not everybody can do this. And I just learned that I, it's best for me to find races that really drive me because when they're that long and things are going really south, it's easy to give up 
unless it's something that you're like really passionate about. Like when I saw comrades and the photos and the, the thousands of people and the diversity and, um, you know, exploring a new part of the world and stuff like that, that's what really drove me there. If it wasn't a race that I cared about or something like that, I probably would have just dropped out. So I do find I'm struggling right now. Like what's next? Like, how do I top that? How do you top comrades? I, for one, do not have a great answer. It really is a -a one-of-a-kind experience. And that brings us to the end of Sika Henry's story. For now, of course. And I do look forward to seeing what Sika chooses to do from here. I want to thank Sika for coming on the podcast to tell this story. I'm always particularly grateful when athletes, especially those who compete in the elite and professional levels, are open to telling stories about their less than optimal performances because there is so much to be learned when things don't go according to plan. Sika's story also shows that there's so much more to these pursuits than finishing times and placings. And for the record, Sika finished Comrades in 9 hours, 13 minutes. And of course, I will provide links in the show notes to all the ways that you can keep up with Sika Henry. She's on Instagram at Sika Henry, and she has a website, SikaHenry.com. I will also provide links to how you can keep up with women's running stories, as well as hear her sports and keeping track. In addition, you'll find links to all of our comrades' episodes, as well as our episodes featuring other women on the list. And finally, I will also supply a link to the New York Times article that Sika referred to in her story. As always, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back soon with another woman's running story. Until then, this is Cherie wishing you healthy, joyful strides forward. Women's running, running, running. Running Running stories. stories.